Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you're gracious and kind, and what, what a testimony. The day starts out so good for Ruth and all the celebrations and turns so tragic so quick. I just ask, Lord, that what has happened to Jim and Ruth and their family, that you would continue to bring comfort, bring peace, bring your Holy Spirit to bring comfort and peace, and encourage them that you're still in control. Encourage all of us this morning that you're still in control, that you know what you're doing, that you have a plan, you're working your plan that's for our good and for your glory. And we just ask right now that something significant would happen as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Quid pro quo. Perhaps you've heard of the terminology where quid pro quo means that I will do something for you, but I expect you to do something for me in return. Many of our relationships work off this quid pro quo. You can think about children and parents, say, I will do this for you if you'll do it for me in return. Marriages are often based upon quid pro quo. You can think about the five love languages. I will speak your love language, but I expect you in return to speak my love language. Relationships are often built on quid pro quo. A lot of preaching that you will often hear is quid pro quo preaching. Some of the prosperity gospel preachers that you should not be watching on TV will preach certain things like if you give money, then God is going to bless you. You do this, God will do that. Or if you exhibit a certain amount of faith, God will heal you and make you prosperous. It's this give and take relationship. It's transactional. But if we're not careful, even as solid Bible-believing Christians, we can start to build our relationship with God on quid pro quo, that I will do certain things and I expect God to do certain things in return. I will get up, I will have a quiet time, I will make sure that I'm serving in the church, I'll make sure that I'm praying a certain amount of times per week. I'll make sure that I am serving. And in return, though we would never say this, in return, I expect some health at least. I expect God to at least give me some blessings or at least not to make me miserable. And if we're not careful, we can turn our relationship with God into a quid pro quo transactional relationship. But I tell you what, here's the problem. Suffering will undercut the quid pro quo gospel every time. It really will. Suffering will just undercut it. I mean, we can understand God bringing suffering into our lives because of discipline, right? We, we get that. He disciplines those he loves. We understand that. Where he brings pain into our lives where we're veering out of the lines, but suffering that comes our way that we have no explanation for or we have no reason for, it can just blow up this quid pro quo gospel because, I don't know if you know this, but our relationship with the Lord is not meant to be transactional. It's meant to be relational. And even during times of suffering, we may not know why certain things are happening, but what we're supposed to do is draw near the Lord, trust him in his sovereign control, believe he's working for our good. But here's the problem, and this is why we're preaching Job. This is exactly why we're preaching Job, is because we really often don't have a theology of suffering it's some of us have no category. We've read way too many Christian books that talk about prosperity, blessings, and all these other things. We've watched too much 
preaching about prosperity, and we, and they're not even coming from the prosperity teachers. They're just coming from mainline evangelicals, and we have no category when suffering drops. Last night I saw a picture, and I want to share it with you. Can we share this picture? This is great. Two people on a roller coaster. On the left is the Puritans. The Puritans, when God gave them painful and difficult trials. On the right, modern evangelicals thinking about any amount of discomfort. I mean, think about it. The Puritans in the past rooted in the sovereignty of God. God is bringing pain. I mean, it's not that dramatic. They're not lifting their hands. But they understood when suffering come their way, God's doing something. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. They may not know it. God, let's do it. Let, whatever you want to do. But we cringe. We don't know how to function. We have no category for suffering. And that's why we're studying the book of Job. So go ahead and turn there. Chapter four. So far in the book, we have seen interaction between Satan and God where Satan was given permission to torment Job to try to prove his point. And what was Satan's point? That Job only worships God based upon a quid pro quo gospel, right? Satan said, Oh, Job worships you because you give him the stuff. Take away the stuff and he'll curse you to your face. So God said, have at it. Job's 10 kids were killed. His health wiped out as well as his wealth. His body's tormented with boils. He's miserable. He wants to die. And he doesn't know why God is allowing this to happen to him. But thankfully... Job has these friends who have traveled a long way to comfort him. Some time has passed. They, they hear about Job suffering and they want to come and they want to, and they want to comfort him. And they finally arrive on the scene. They can barely recognize him. Job has these boils and scabs and all over him. He looks totally different. And they came and they just sat with him. That was the best thing they ever did. They sat with him, but they started to hear Job complaining. They started to hear Job talking to God in ways they did not approve. And so they could not keep silent, but had to open their big mouths. And what we're going to have is three rounds of them talking and basically the rest of the book. Round one, we'll have Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar speaking and Job speaking back to them. We'll have the same thing in round two. And round three, we're going to introduce a new friend. But this morning, it's a good morning. We're going to cover 99 verses. Chapter four through seven, Eliphaz, round one, let's go. Chapter four, verse one. Then Eliphaz, the Temanite, answered, if one ventures a word with you, will you become impatient? But who can refrain from speaking? Behold, you have admonished many and you have straightened, strengthened weak hands. Your words have helped the tottering to stand and you have strengthened feeble knees. But now it has come to you and you are impatient. It touches you and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence and the integrity of your ways your hope? Now, Eliphaz is likely the oldest of the three. In fact, we know from another chapter that he is older than Job. And Eliphaz is the kind of counselor that has something really hard to say, but tries to ease into it gently. And Eliphaz cautiously tries to reason with Job and hopes that Job has the patience to hear him out. He thought about holding his tongue, but Job is so far off in his theology that Eliphaz has to jump in and correct him. He's basically saying, Job, you were so good for those who are struggling. You gave strength to the weak. You acknowledge that those who walk with the Lord walk with integrity. Now you who taught others, now teach yourself. 
The whole implication of this argument from Eliphaz is going to be is that Job is not innocent, and that is why he is suffering. Job is not innocent, and that is why he is suffering. Let's continue. Verse 7. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. By the breath of God, they perish, and by the blast of his anger, they come to an end. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of prey, and the whelps of the lioness are scattered. Now, Eliphaz basically argues that the innocent are never punished. Notice at the end of verse 8, it says, And those who sow trouble harvest it. You reap what you sow before the Lord. It's on you. There was a, a sermon series preached not too long ago, and the sermon series was titled, When You, Then God. When you do something, God will do this. And the idea is that if you do this, then your marriage will flourish. If you do this, then your kids will be obedient and successful in life. Now, I know many of you were raised on those types of sermons. And you did this, but that didn't happen. And now you're older and somewhat jaded and frustrated. Because you did the first part and the second part didn't happen. And Elevaz would say... That's on you. That's you. It's on you. You're not innocent. You you must have done something wrong in the first part. That's why you didn't get the second part. That's on you. The basis of the argument is you're being punished for your sin. All you need to do is repent of your sin, and God will turn this whole thing around. Elevaz is pretty much saying, I know how God works. God is predictable, and I know how he works, and all you need to do, Job, is repent, and you'll be restored, simple as that. Because you do good, you get good, do bad, you get bad. Now, that makes sense, right? I mean, that's kind of how we operate. You were drinking and driving, you got into an accident, now you walk with a limp. That's on you. You committed adultery, and your husband left you, and your life has blown up, that's on you. You lost your house because bad investments, that's on you. You're in your 70s, maybe you're feeling all alone because you've been mean to people your whole life, that's on you. It's it's, it's kind of biblical, right? Galatians chapter 6 and 7, chapter 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. There's so much truth in, truth in that, right? You sow drunkenness, you sow adultery, you sow gambling, you sow meanness, you will reap the consequences. And Eliphaz is arguing, Job, you must have sown something because you are reaping the consequences. All you need to do is repent and you'll be healed. Now, I don't know if you've ever talked to people like this before where... Um, All of your problems are because of your sin, and all of their problems are because of the attacks of Satan. You ever talk to anybody like that? Like, oh, you fell and broke your hip in the kitchen. You must have done something wrong. But if they fell and broke their hip in the kitchen, it's because Satan was trying to attack them and, and thwart their ministry. But even if you don't have someone speaking to you like that, every single person in here has an inner Eliphaz, where if something's going wrong in your life, you must have caused it. And you have this accusing and condemning inner Eliphaz. When my wife and I were living in Chicago, we would meet with couples who were infertile. So much tears and pain. We would meet with couples whose kids were having medical complications. Once again, tears and pain. And some of these couples had so much struggle that their infertility or their illness of their kids were their fault. 
and this inner Eliphaz was accusing them, this is your fault. Now, I don't know if any of you brought Eliphaz with you to church today. But by the end of the service, we're going to try to quiet that voice with the gospel of grace. All right. Let's let Eliphaz continue to talk, talk, talk. Verse 12. Now a word. Oh, this is ridiculous. This is really, he's going to prove how right he is because he had a dream. Okay. Now a word was brought to me stealthily and my ear received a whisper of it. Amid disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, dread came upon me and trembling and made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed by my face. The hair of my flesh bristled up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice. Can mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? He puts no trust even in his servants. And against his angels, he charges error. How much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. Between morning and evening, they are broken in pieces. Unobserved, they perish forever. Is not their tent court plucked up within them? They die yet without wisdom. So he's describing this scary vision or nightmare he had where dread came upon him and he was trembling and his hairs are standing up and a spirit passes by his face. And the question is asked, can mankind be just before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? And then he goes on to describe fallen angels. And if God punishes fallen angels, then he will surely punish someone who has sinned. Surely he will punish humans who live in houses of clay. This is his implication. I had a dream. God punishes the wicked. And you, my friend, are the wicked. Yeah, it's you, Job. I had a dream. God showed me in a dream that you are the one who's done something wrong. And now you're facing the consequences. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever had a vision or a dream for your life. But my executive pastor at my last church, he moved from Chicago moved from Minnesota to Chicago. And when he first got there, they could not buy a house because their house in Minnesota wouldn't sell. So they're jumping from rental to rental to rental. In addition, their van that they were driving were in two horrific wrecks where one time it was totaled. So they couldn't sell their house in Minnesota. They were jumping from rental to rental. Their van is destroyed. And this calamity upon calamity upon calamity, and it went on for a long time. And then some lady in my church went up to him. And she said, I had a vision. God has told me the reason why all these calamities are falling upon you is you should have never left Minnesota. It's your fault. That's what Eliphaz is doing. He's saying, all this hard stuff, Job, is on you. You're the one at fault. And it doesn't get any better. We don't need to go on and on here. But in chapter 5, he goes on and on. And he says how God punishes sinners. Look with me real quick at at verse 8. We'll just jump around on this one. Verse 8. Here's some good old advice from him. But as for me, I would seek God and would place my cause before God. So he's basically saying God's a God of justice and he only deals justly. And if you think you're a just Job, okay, present your case before God. But know this. He punishes those who do wrong and lifts up the repentant. Jump to verse 11. Verse 11. So that he sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the plotting of the shrewd so that their hands cannot attain success. Verse 13. He captures the wise by their own shrewdness and the advice of the cunning is quickly thwarted. Let's jump down to verse 17. And he continues on, verse 17. Behold, how happy is the man who God reproves, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. 
for he inflicts pain and gives relief. He wounds and his hands also heal. All right. Jump down to verse 27. Verse 27. Behold, this we have investigated it. And so it is. Hear it and know for yourself. Once again, we know how God works. He's predictable. Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. We've investigated it. And we know what your problem is, Job. You have sinned. You may not think you've sinned, but you have. Because look at your life. It's a mess. All you need to do is repent, be forgiven, and be restored. Now, are there times when God brings suffering and challenges into our lives when it has nothing to do with a particular sin? The answer, 2022 evangelicals, is yes. In fact, a very well-known verse that we don't like to think about says in 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So sometimes you can suffer and it has nothing to do with a specific sin because often the righteous suffer. All of the apostles but one were martyred. Was this because of the apostles' sin? No. Those who follow Jesus in this world will have trouble. But behold, he's overcome the world. Now, the disciples were little mini Eliphazes running around because they had trouble with this concept. I don't know if you know this story, but there's this story in the book of John where they run across this man who is blind since birth. And the disciples, they're just so compassionate. They ask the question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who did it? Was it him? His parents? There was some input. There's the output. His fault, his parents' fault. And Jesus says, it was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed. So the man wasn't born blind because of some sin, because Jesus was about to heal him and display the works of God. So Jesus heals the man by spitting on the ground and mixing it with dirt, and he puts it on the man's eyes, and the man goes to wash in the pool of Siloam and is healed. And you know, suffering doesn't always come our way because of some specific sin. Sometimes, maybe, Suffering comes our way because Jesus is about to display the works of God in your life. I talk to pastors every week across the country. Many of them are not doing well. And if I can combine their story, it would go something like this. I'm on the phone with them. They're like, okay, I went to seminary and I really went into debt. And now I'm working for a church who pays me barely a living wage. I'm having so much stress in my family that it's causing conflict with my wife and I and my kids. It's not that they're rebellious. I don't hear many of those stories. The stories I hear are often of the kids being sick. Some of the kids, really, I talk to pastors whose kids are going blind I talked to one pastor who was living in a parsonage that uh, had mold and affected the children where they had to go to the hospital, story after story after story. And some pastors I talked to, they have the quid pro quo gospel. Not completely, but they're asking questions like, God, I'm here to serve you. I went into debt to serve you. I preach your word. I tell people about Jesus. Where are the blessings? Where are the blessings? God, I'm doing everything for you. Why aren't you doing anything for me? At least don't work against me. And you have the disciples and you have Eliphaz on the sidelines saying, you probably did something wrong. 
And what would God say? This has happened to display the works of God. What does the book say in New Testament? What does Paul hear when God would not remove his thorn from him? God says, my power is perfected in weakness. And then Paul goes on to say, I will boast in my weaknesses, boast in my sufferings, because when I am weak, he is strong. So perhaps something has happened in your life and you're wondering, what have I done wrong? What is the purpose? Perhaps God is going to continue to work on your heart and use you even in your weakness. So what do you think Job thinks about all of this Eliphaz quid pro quo gospel? Well, let's see Job's opinion. He's not too thrilled. Chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. Job says, Oh, that my request might come to pass and that God would grant my longing. (laughs) What does he long for? To die. Would that God were willing to crush me, that he would loose his hand and just cut me off. God, just get it over with. Take me out. Verse 10, but it is still my consolation and I rejoice in unsparing pain that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Even in the midst of all the pain, he is not denying the Lord or cursing him. Satan was wrong. Job is not sinless, but he believes that he hasn't done anything to justify the punishment, but he doesn't curse God. Now Job goes after Eliphaz. Look at verse 14 and 15. For the despairing man, there should be kindness from his friend (laughs) so that he does not forsake the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have acted deceitfully like a wadi, like the torrents of wadis which vanish. (laughs) It's like Job is saying, you're supposed to be my friend and a friend is supposed to help me in my suffering, yet you have been treacherous. I'm ready to be comforted. Feel free to start any time. Job continues on, verse 24. Look what he says. Teach me and I'll be silent. Show me how I have erred. Verse 28. Now please look at me and see if I lie to your face. Job's like, look me in the eye. Look, Eliphaz, I'm an open book. Go ahead and point out my sin. Show me. Whatever. Just show me my sin. Come on. Show me. I'm not lying. I've done nothing wrong. And then in chapter 7, look what he says in verse 4. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night continues, and I'm continuously tossing until dawn. Anybody ever do that, tossing and turning in bed? My flesh is clothed with worms. Anybody got worms right now? Mm, That's nasty. He's scraping himself with pottery. My flesh is clothed with worms and a crust of dirt. My skin hardens and runs, so there's pus coming out of the sores. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to an end without hope. Remember that my life is but breath. My eye will not again see good. He's tossing and turning. He's suffering. He's ready for his life to be over with. And now he's going to just pour out his complaint to God. Finish up. Let's finish up here. Verse 16. I waste away. I will not live forever. Leave me alone for my days are but a breath. What is man that you magnify him and that you are concerned about him, that you examine him every morning and try him every moment? Will you never turn your gaze away from me nor let me alone until I swallow my spittle? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? 
For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me, but I will not be. It's like he's coming to God, pouring out his complaint. God, why are you using me as target practice? Why am I going through this suffering? And he knows that nothing good or nothing bad can happen to him unless it's from the hand of God. So he's bringing his complaint to God. He has no idea why this has happened to him, but he knows God. So let's do this. Let's compare Eliphaz and Job, okay? Eliphaz. God is predictable. I know how things work. Eliphaz. God is predictable. I know how things work. Repent. All will be restored. Just do this, and God will do that. It's an easy quid pro quo gospel. Put the right input, the transaction will happen, and you'll get the right results from God. That's Eliphaz's mindset. Well, here's Job's mindset God is unpredictable, and that is where his angst lies. Job has no idea why suffering has come his way. All that he knows is that God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All he knows is that God is sovereign and God is good. He's going to trust him. He's going to praise him. And he's going to take his complaint to God. There are things that happen that we have no explanation for. Someone uh, communicated to me this week, Uh, from our congregation and recommended a book called When God Doesn't Make Sense. So I I picked up the book and the first story I read in the book was about a guy named Chuck Fry. Chuck Fry was a very smart, driven young man. He made high school straight A's, went to college, got it done quick, and he felt called to go to medical school. He enrolls in medical school at USC, tries to get in. Very few get into the medical school at USC. He gets in. And during his first year, he feels that God is calling him to be a medical missionary. He feels like that God is telling him to forego all the lucrative medical practices he could have here in the States, that he was to go and to be a medical missionary. He's on fire. He's pumped about Jesus. But at the end of his first year of medical school, he's diagnosed with acute leukemia. He died six months later. End of story. That's the end of the story. There's no other ending. That's it. And you may think, why did that happen? He had driven us for the Lord. He had passion for the Lord. He's excited about going to serve the Lord as a medical missionary. Think of all the thousands of people that could be healed by him. Eliphaz would say, it's probably something he did. He did something and God took him out. And Job would come on the scene and he would say, I have no explanation, but God gives and God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is sovereign. He has a plan. And he's working his plan. And Eliphaz would say, no, 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 no. No, the, the innocent are not punished. And we would say, excuse me, let me introduce you to Jesus. The most innocent one who's ever existed, sinless. And Jesus was treated as sin on the cross, as God is pouring out wrath on the completely innocent one who should not be suffering, right? Because he's, he's innocent, Eliphaz. He does, innocent don't suffer. Well, Jesus is suffering so that the guilty will not be punished. That's the gospel right there. The innocent one is punished and the guilty go free. Take that, Eliphaz. Think about that one for a while. And so when your inner Eliphaz is accusing you in your mind, in your heart, just keep going back to the gospel of grace. I am saved by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone. It's grace. And we're forgiven in Jesus. 
And I know that we go through seasons of difficulties and trial and our inner Eliphaz is just screaming at us, you deserve this. So I don't know who's going through something right now and your, your mind is thinking, I deserve this. I deserve this. When in reality, maybe it's not God bringing something your way for some specific sin. Maybe it's God allowing something to come your way so that the works of God may be displayed in your life. So when you find yourself accusing yourself, maybe you should speak back to yourself. Maybe you should speak to your inner Eliphaz and say, I am forgiven in Jesus Christ. I am not condemned. God is for me, not against me. And I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, that God is for you, not against you. He loves his people that he has called, that he has justified, that he has sanctified, and that he will soon glorify. He is for you, not against you. So take that inner Eliphaz, quiet that voice, and lift up the gospel of grace. Let's pray. Lord, the reality is, as many of us don't know why we're going through what we're going through right now, and we may never get an explanation, but we know that you are good, and we know that you are working for our good. Help us to truly believe that you've never left us, that you have never forsaken us, and you will not leave us or forsake us. And Lord, the reality is we're not completely innocent at all. We're guilty before you. In fact, we deserve, we deserve hell, wrath forever, and yet we get grace. So help us to stake our hearts on grace, that you are for us, not against us. And you saved us, and you'll finish this work in us, no matter what trials we go through. Help us to believe and stake our lives on your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.